Hey there friends and welcome to Northern Nevada. Pretty obscure location and I've got to give proper shout out to my students, Dwayne and Amarissa. The, they're the folks who keyed me into this really amazing outcrop and location. And once I saw their pictures of it, I thought I've got to get out there. I've got to look at this with my own eyes. And then once I got here, I thought I got to also make a video and share this with folks. So what we have here, let's go ahead and swing around is uh, an area of northern Nevada, juniper trees. Not a whole lot going on regionally. There are, uh, as a granitic intrusion, in fact, I'll show you some of the blocks here on the ground, a Jurassic aged intrusion. There are some Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. And then blanketing this landscape of northern Nevada are in places thin, absent, or sometimes thick deposits of volcanic ash. So let's take a look at this here. This really immense and huge cliff of volcanic ash is just pretty amazing. I'm trying to back up to get it all in. You've got my truck down there at the bottom for scale. Probably at least 100 feet, 35 meters or so. And then beyond this cliff, there's even more that goes up the slope. So if you look at it, on Google Earth. Now there's nothing published on this information, uh, no detailed geologic maps. I'm totally winging it here, but I've seen exposures of ash like this in Northern Nevada before along the Southern border of Idaho, not nearly this thick as we see here in this location, but in most places, what we find is that this ash is related to the Yellowstone hotspot. This ash, although I don't know the age of it, it's not been published to my knowledge, I would guess this ash is anywhere from 13 to maybe 8 million years old, and it likely came from one of two sources, either the Twin Falls Volcanic Field or the next volcanic center to the southwest in the Yellowstone Hotspot track, the Bruno Jarbage Volcanic Field. Here is a map that shows the volcanic centers associated with the Yellowstone hotspot across southern Idaho and going into northern Nevada. Notice the progression starts here with the McDermott volcanic field around 16 million years old and then progresses up to the northeast finally arriving in Yellowstone around 2 million years ago. The two volcanic centers that are the most likely sources of the volcanic ash we're looking at here in northern Nevada would be the Bruno Jarbage volcanic field here dated from 12.7 to 10.5 million years and the Twin Falls volcanic center about 10 and a half to eight and a half or so million years centered in this region and for context the location of this video is located right here where the star is. Now let's go ahead and go take a look at this thing. You can see that there's a couple changes here. There's the gray unit at the bottom, and then there's a, a pronounced, the most notable layer is this white layer that runs through that. But then moving up from that point is a sequence of uninterrupted, as far as I can tell, beige to gray ash in places. It changes color, but I think some of those more reddish colors up there are due to weathering. There doesn't seem to be any breaks in this. I could be wrong, just coming here for the first time. I did wander around up on top, which was pretty cool. Um, it looks like this, most of this entire sequence was maybe from one eruption. I would, I would allow that this bottom section might be an older eruption. But nonetheless, if you go from that white line, uh, that white bed, all the way up to the top of the cliff. And then, like I said, it goes even beyond that up the ridge there. It's a really impressive stack of volcanic ash. So let's go take a look at it first and then maybe come up with a couple ideas as to why there's so much ash um, in this part of Northern Nevada. Um, here on the grounds, one of the, I mentioned there's the Jurassic aged granitic rocks, granodiorites to be exact. Here's a chunk of it on the ground. So you do see this in places. This is sort of the bedrock of this area, this intrusion. And then if we start over here, let's actually start with the lower unit. A lot of the holes you're gonna see over here are because this ash, this tuff, because it's turned into ash, turned into rock, is quite soft. There's been um, burrowing 
insects that have actually burrowed into it. You can see how soft this stuff is. It's very crumbly, very what we'd call friable. Um, there's also a little bit of graffiti out here where people have carved their names into the rock, unfortunately. Um, but here's the lower gray layer. And then the contact there with the white layer. Now, sometimes you can get different colors of ash in the same eruptive sequence just by tapping different portions of the magma chamber. So the, if the magma chamber has a little bit of zonation to it or the composition varies a little bit top to bottom, as that eruption taps deeper and deeper levels of the magma chamber, you can sometimes get some different uh, colors involved there. Um, but the white material seems to be quite fine-grained. Um, and again, there's really not a solid break. I'm not seeing any obvious erosional surfaces as it grades from the white unit up into the gray. We've got a black spot here where people have uh, had campfires. But what's interesting to me is the beginning of this gray layer above the white um, does contain, let me find a good spot to show you some of these, has some particles in it, some rock particles in it, possibly material thrown out during the eruption. So um, in the initial phases of the eruption. From what I can best tell, this unit and this tuff does not look to me like a pyroclastic flow, doesn't have some of the, the characteristic features we see with some of the Snake River Plain, Yellowstone, rhyolitic, pyroclastic flows. So I think this is mostly ash fall. This is ash that came out of one of the big volcanoes to the north in the Snake River Plain. And this was ash that was just raining down on the landscape. And initially it might have been quite explosive because we do find these larger chunks, these you know pebble uh, BB-sized particles in the ash, at least during this the bottom of this, this uh, main unit here. As we work our way up, and so there is a slight tilt to the rock, so as I head to our left here, we are seeing slightly younger units. Here's some more little chunks of rock. Um, this one here actually looks like a piece of pumice. There's some holes in it as well. See if the zoom feature on my new fancy camera is a little bit helpful there. Um, and so you can see some of these particles, possibly older rocks that have ripped up and blown out during the vent clearing phase as the eruption commenced. Um, again, would love for a, a good volcanologist to come out here with me and help me make heads or tails of this. Then there's a, a little bit of a contact right here um, where this unit, again, it might have a, a, a tiny bit of erosion into it or a little bit of a discontinuity here. Uh, and then we start getting the more layered ash. So we leave behind the larger particles, and then we get into the layering here. So I would allow that, that maybe, and there's definitely a little color change here, a little bit of brown in places, some oxidation. So this could possibly be two different units, but they look like they're, they're more or less grading into one, or if there is a time component here between the two, my guess it would be pretty minimal in terms of time. And then you get into these more classic, um, evenly bedded, thinly bedded, um, tufts that we commonly see. Again, the ash just kind of raining down in places. You might be able to see here, again, we'll try the zoom. These lighter colored layers are a little bit more fine-grained ash, and then these darker layers are a little bit more coarse, more of a medium grain size versus this more fine grain size here. Um, pretty awesome. And then we get all the holes here, obviously, again, like I said, uh, from the burrowing insects. Uh, as we work our way to the far left side of this outcrop. Uh, I guess the, the cool thing here that we can talk about is you start seeing more of this patina surface, this red uh, iron oxide coating that forms a bit more resistant sections to the rock. So you can see these areas are a little bit harder here where the red is. Let's find a good one up there maybe. But then where the gray material is, it's a little bit softer in this little section here. So you get a, a little bit more um, kind of cavernous weathering uh, where these kind of like holes and caves eroded into the tuff, but pretty fantastic. Um, you know, the more you look at these 
eruptive phases from Yellowstone, and not just in Yellowstone. When you come out to places like this or looking at places in the Snake River Plain, I'm just more awestruck every time I see just what this volcanic feature has done uh, in many places to the landscape and just the, the power of some of these eruptions. So uh, again, just my two cents interpretation on the whole thing we're seeing here, potentially a uh, large, well, definitely a large cliff of volcanic tuff of ash potentially from one eruptive event, possibly two or more. Uh, again, I've only spent a few minutes here, so lots of work could be done here. And so the question might come up as to how do you get this much ash preserved in this location? I mean, you see it here, uh, we can trace it over onto this hillside, but then as you look at the surrounding area, it's not over there. And so a couple things come to mind here. It's possible that the ash was deposited here because this was a um, preferential location, maybe a low spot in the topography, uh, a basin where more ash could be deposited and not just deposited, but preserved in the rock record. Uh, a lot of this ash, as we've seen, is quite crumbly, easily weathered. And so it would stand to reason that if you blanket the landscape with this stuff, it's pretty easy to move it and mobilize it over time. And so, um, well, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back to the, there we go, back to the cliff face there. So it's possible that you get this stuff deposited in some deep basin where we can preserve much of its thickness. It's also possible, um, again, just spitballing ideas out here, that right along the face of this really impressive outcrop, there may at one point have been a fault. And this side with the tuff could have been, I guess, either the upthrown or the downthrown side. I mean, it's obviously sticking up now, but maybe at one point it was the down dropped block. Um, and so you might sometimes preserve units like this on one side of a fault. So if you allow vertical fault movement, uh, you could push this down, uh, maybe cover it with some other sediments or other material. And maybe it's just been in the geologic recent past that it's actually been exhumed and exposed and now it's and now it's weathering again but a um, couple options there maybe faulted or maybe just the paleo topography the topography that existed here when this uh, event occurred but gosh would love to have the the budget to actually either do the geochemistry to see which uh, source in the snake river plain it might have come from to also get the age um, and also maybe get someone out here with me uh, preferably with me to look at this in detail and help me figure out exactly what's going on. But probably two units would be my guess, possibly one, but again, possibly more than two I would allow as well. So uh, pretty incredible. So there you have it. Um, really cool outcrop. Thanks again to my students, Dwayne and Amarissa, for keying me in on this fantastic exposure uh, here in northern Nevada. Hope you've enjoyed this little look into what the Yellowstone Volcano does in some of these places. Thanks again for your time. Appreciate your support of the channel and we'll see you next time. Take care.